accomplished. Now, interestingly, for our series of 137 patients, where about 70% of them were done using contact for sense and the 30% were not, we did not find the difference in the overall outcomes whether we were using contact for sense or not. And that we attribute uh, primarily to using ICE technology for uh, uh, mapping these areas. So I think ICE overcomes some of the limitations that non-contact force sensing has. You can really visualize the catheter tip and you don't always need contact force sensing to tell you whether you're in good contact or not. Okay, so this is sort of, you know, where we are and how we got to this point. So during the procedure itself, what are some of the observations? And so, you know, when you're trying to go after these arrhythmias, Generally, activation mapping is the preferred tool. And, uh, you know, using electroatomic mapping together with ice guidance, you really now have the ability to sample uh, different aspects of the capillary muscle. And so here are three examples. Uh, in the first case, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is a phenomenon that you don't always see, but when you see it, it's uh, helpful. So here is uh, sinus rhythm QRS complex, and then here is the clinical rhythm. So during the sinus rhythm QRS complex, you see this late potential, which uh, reverses itself during the actual PVC. Here it precedes the uh, QRS complex for about 30 minutes. Now the second example, here during sinus rhythm, we have an electrogram, but there's nothing really interesting about it. And the PVC, um, prior to that, the same site has something which precedes the QRS for about 25 milliseconds. And this was a successful ablation site, but there's nothing very unique about this electrogram. It's just good. And then the third scenario, is an older patient where at the site where the ablation was successful, you see this highly fractionated, long, um, somewhat small electrogram preceding this far from larger electrogram. And this precedes the QRS complex for 15 minutes. And so, again, there isn't an absolute criteria that you can say, well, if I have this and I'm successful, you just have to map and find the earliest location. Sometimes you'll find a sharp electrogram and late potentials during sinus rhythm. Other times you'll find highly fractionated electrogram. And sometimes it may just be a regular electrogram. It's just the earliest. Now, face mapping can be helpful, but it's really not your primary tool. So here are two examples. And the first, Case, the papillary muscle, it's a posterior medial papillary muscle, the catheter is sitting right on the body of this map. That was the site of the earliest activation. And the face map there, so this proprietary algorithm that Carter has where they can actually do a match and give you a percentage of how close the match is to the native QRS is about 94% from the Here's another example, also of a posterior medium pap PVC, where the catheter is nicely tucked onto this pap. There's a nice contact force here of 19 or so, and the passive match here is close to 99%. So this is a great match, this is a good match. But the bottom line is that we don't always get such good matches. And part of the reason is the mechanism of these arrhythmias. Sometimes the Purkinje uh, source is deep in the papillary muscle and at the exit site where your catheter is, you're capturing adjacent part of the papillary muscle and so the QRS complex is not really um, that great. So, so for a variety of reasons, um, pace mapping uh, is really not to go to two. We all use it. So for the series that I showed you of 137 patients, in about 85% of them, we did do pace mapping at the site of ablation, and the match was about 95%. But if the match is off, 
and the site is still the earliest, then you would have made it. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. The face mapping is not consistent here. Now, once you get to the earliest site and you're sure about that being the earliest location, then typically during power application, you can see a couple of things. In some cases, like for example in panel A, you see the clinical PVC, you come on ablation at the earliest site, and almost immediately there is abolition of the clinical room. And that's great. And, um, you know, that happens, our uh, approach is to continue applying power there for 60 to 90 seconds, and then give a few more lesions in that spot, um, which is oftentimes necessary to you know, get an effective lesion. Now, here is another scenario where when you come on ablation at the site of the earliest activation, you see a flurry of uh, its rapid monomorphic BT, which is very similar to the clinical room. And in fact, that's something that I tell my lab staff all the time, that as I'm coming on, I want somebody to be near the teeth later, because this is not an uncommon observation, that sometimes there is the pro effect of energy application, you can see something like this. In patients who present with PVC mediated ventricular fibrillation and polymorphic sometimes during energy application, it can actually go into the air. And so that's what you have to be cognizant of. But if you see something like this, this is a great sign too, just as good a sign as this. And so in either of these scenarios, if you find this, either of these scenarios are approaches to continue with the power for the 60 to 90 seconds that sometimes give additional regions in and around that spot. Now, there are other observations that uh, you, you, can, you can have. And so here's an example of uh, PVC. Uh, and so you can see here that this PVC has a superior axis, positive forces in the lead AVL, right in the branch of morphology, transition by morphology 4. So this is consistent with a posterior medium site of lesion and we mapped it there and when we come on you can see that this PVC goes away but then just a few seconds into the lesion you find this other PVC starting to break through and this has got a totally different axis. It is inferiorly directed and AVL is negative. So you've transitioned during ablation of posterior medial papillary muscle to an anterior lateral papillary muscle. And so in the series of 137 patients uh, that uh, we put together, which is currently in the review, about 20% of the times the uh, ventricular arrhythmias can have uh, more than one morphology. Now, another scenario that uh, you can sometimes encounter is what I'm going to show you here. So, this is the clinical arrhythmia, uh, superiorly directed, 2, 3, and ABF were negative. AVL is positive, transition is by V3, V1 is biphasic, consistent with the post-stereomedial source. And in this particular case, using eye segmented anatomy to define the post medial fat, we identified a site of origin which was highly fractionated, catheters tucked under the papillary muscle, the vector is looking up, and this is 50 milliseconds pre QR. And that's really great. So after we ablate there, that PVC changes and it transitions into this PVC. So you can see now there are subtle differences. 2, 3, and AVF are much more negative. They lack that initial R. The V1 looks very different from the V1 in the first PVC. So for this PVC, we continued mapping in the posterior medial fab because the other features suggest that it's still in the vicinity of the structure. And it turns out that this particular site was almost 90 millimeters away from the previous site. So it's more lateral and actually on top of the pathway. And again, you can see this location is 45 milliseconds pre-QRS. So in this particular instance, we kind of went from this site where we ablated first, and then we ablated in the opposite location of the lateral wall, and then we gave 
a few reinforcing and distinguish. Yeah, but you could argue that the source of this particular arrhythmia may have been somewhere in the center. And the first lesion clipped off this exit, it started exiting on the other side. And the reason why we did something in between is to really get a source, because if you did not do that, there's a good possibility that it may find an exit elsewhere. It didn't happen during that case, but that's kind of what you have to imagine in terms of where the likely location of the source is if you're confronting the instantaneous. Now, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand, you know, how the papillary muscle and the sources behave. And this is not an exact science. I mean, you're using the successful ablation site as the presumptive location of the source. And that is obviously, you know, erroneous in itself, that particular line of thinking, but that's the best that we can do. And so the way we uh, try to look at our own experience is to divide the papillary muscle into three segments. So the base of the papillary muscle is close to the RV, LV apex. The tip of the papillary muscle is kind of where the cordia attach. Some people call it the head of the papillary muscle. And then of course the remaining segment is the body of the papillary muscle. So we looked at uh, all the patients uh, that we had ablated to characterize the distribution of the lesions. And so in kind of putting it all together, there were some things that you know we summarized here, which is, you know, as I told you earlier, for our series, we used contact force sensing about 70% of the times. And then we did use it. The typical force that we were able to achieve is about 10 to 11 grams. And again, that's not surprising, right? I mean, these are dynamic intracavitary structures. You apply too much force to the catheter, it's going to slide on. So if you get 10 to 11 grams, you'll be really happy. And typically to get success on an average, you have to give about 14 lesions, but about 20% of the times we could get by with five lesions or less, and about 20% uh, uh, of the times we have to give 20 plus lesions. Now in terms of the distribution of the lesions, uh, about uh, a third of the lesions, or maybe even more, about 40% of the lesions were either near the tip or near the base. And only about 10 to 15% of the times did we have to ablate exclusively in the body of the papillary muscle. So again, yeah, you can't really make much from the ablation uh, point in terms of imagining that the source is necessarily there. But if we go with you know, these observations that you had to either ablate the base or the tip, uh, what you could probably hypothesize is that if you ablate near the base, then you're ablating the source. And if you ablate near the tip, then you're probably ablating the exit cells. Now, that theory would bear out if you said, well, if you ablate near the base, you get by with a lot fewer lesions than if you're ablating near the tip. But we weren't really able to sort that out because it was a retrospective analysis. So we didn't have the granularity to be able to really sort that out. Because oftentimes you get success and you give a little bit more there and not until you get a cluster of lesions regardless if you are at the base of the apex. But that's kind of what we found in our distribution. Now, interestingly, in only a minority of cases, 15% of the time, did you have to operate the entire extent of the pathogenesis? And that's a good thing. And then, of course, in our experience too, um, in about 12% of the cases after RF ablation was uh, not successful, we used adjuvant cryoablation. We were successful in all those um, 15 patients where we did use cryoablation. So I think that points not to the fact that cryoenergy is more effective, but I think cryoablation allows you to get stability because once you freeze beyond a certain temperature, the catheter sticks, and I think that may have been the reason why our juvenile cryoablation was successful. <clears throat> this is uh, that paper which describes our cryoablation experience was put together by my colleague, Rex Supple. Uh, 16 patients, um, it was a mix of anterolateral, posterior medial papillary muscle, as well as right the papillary muscle cases. About four of these patients actually had the PVC triggered BF, and all these patients uh, prior ablation <clears throat> was able to get its lasting success after our ablation. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, 
the narrative on um, healthy muscle, uh, uh, healthy papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, the RV papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias, you know, you really can use all the techniques that you use for LV papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias to target uh, the RV ones as well. The only thing you have to be cognizant of is that the RV papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias are not confined to just the papillary muscles, but a large number of these cases actually tend to originate in the moderate band, which I'm sure most of you know is the structure that connects the septal aspect of the ventricle to the anterolateral papillary muscle. And while it is uh, 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 an organ that provides some structural stability, it also permits the passage of Purkinje fibers through, and so is a source of ventricular arrhythmias. And again, the anatomy of the structure, you can use eye imaging and eye segmented anatomy to really bring out the different features, oftentimes, the junction of the two structures can be the source of arrhythmias. Other times you actually have to map each of these structures individually and that's where ice guided mapping is just incredibly helpful. I don't know how people can do it without ice once you get used to it. And the features of uh, ventricular arrhythmias originating from the right ventricular papillary muscle, particularly the moderator and again a series of patients that was put together by our group so some of the common features, again, because it's coming from the right ventricle, these tachycardias tend to have a left ventricle branch block morphology or predominantly negative, which is in the Because the moderator band connects with the muscle more closer to the premolar of the ventricle, the precordial transition for these arrhythmias, they tend to be late beyond the V4. Uh, again, because the structure connects closer to the inferior aspect of the ventricle, they tend to have predominantly superiorly directed forces, and then that has positive complexes in these one and eight. And of course, because it's coming close to the pre-wall, the QRS duration tends to be typically more than 150 milliseconds. So the unifying theme is left ventral branch block, superior axis, and late pre transition. <clears throat> and again, the point that I want to make is that the same tools and techniques that you use for mapping and ablating left ventricular papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias, the same principles apply here. And eyes and electroanatomic guided catheter manipulation to identify the earlier site and using those approaches to really target the arrhythmia in our experience is quite efficacious even for this. <clears throat> okay, so. In terms of, you know, some of the challenges, we talked about you know, what the problem is with these structures, the anatomy, the dynamicity, the variability in the uh, mechanisms underlying the arrhythmia is changing at the site. So it's not uncommon that oftentimes you have to map a lot and ablate extensively. In doing so, you have to be cognizant of, you know, where your catheter is. If you're sitting on the papillary muscle and your contact is not great, you can give pretty high power, it's not uncommon that when we know our contact and the papillary is not great, we start with 50 watts of power with a cool tip catheter. Now, that is a lot of power, but if you don't have great contact and the catheter literally is touching the papillary muscle and the contact force is four to five grams, that's okay. But if you are tucked into the papillary muscle and the catheter is at the base of the papillary muscle, when you start off with power of 50 watts or something like that, in a cool tip catheter, you're going to create such a big lesion, and that's not a good thing to do when you're tucked into the papillary muscle and close to the ventricular wall. So, <clears throat> some of the potential complications that you can anticipate in mapping around these structures, catheter entrapment, and the, uh, the cordy, and if you are not aware of that, and you don't pay attention to these things, and move the catheter to abandon you can cause cordial function. That obviously can be an emergency situation if you start free from mitral regurgitation. Even if you don't cause cordial rupture, but you damage the papillary muscle. So I've seen papers, some of the early experiences where you know operators were talking about doing the, the equivalent of 
uh, population related isolation of the papillary muscle. So you go around the base of the papillary muscle and you isolate it. First, I don't think it's possible to isolate the papillary muscle electrically uh, unless there is underlying scar or something like that because to cause through and through burns in the ventricular myocardium around the papillary muscles, I just don't think that's feasible. But in trying to do that, you can certainly damage the papillary muscle and that can cause uh, problems with the valve function. Certainly myocardial perforation is a complication that can happen if you're not cognizant of where your catheter is and your power delivery. And then of course, with, with any left ventricular or left side of regulation, there's always the risk of thrombone complications and certainly you know, vascular access complications. But in our own experience, the incidence of complications is generally low. In our entire series of 137 patients, we had only five complications, which were basically two pericardial effusions that were treated with just pericardiosynthesis, uh, one case of pseudoaneurysm and a groin hemorrhage. So it's uncommon if you're careful with your mapping and power. Okay, so to summarize, uh, papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias, they are not an uncommon source. I mean, they're not the most common source. Our own Incidence of all the arrhythmias from the ventricle that we have laid, papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmia is about 8%. Uh, they can have a diverse presentation ranging all the way from isolated to PVC, which you see 70% of the times, to polymorphic VT or VF triggered by them, which is you know, less than 10% of the times. Because of their location, they manifest unique ECG features. We talked about that. Um, the management, of course, is based on clinical presentation. Uh, you certainly have the luxury to do a few things if the patient is presenting with isolated PVCs, even if the burden is high, but they are asymptomatic and the LV function is preserved. You have the luxury to kind of try different things. But the bottom line is that uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers are generally not effective for these arrhythmias. Anti arrhythmic drugs, also in our experience, really don't do much, maybe 40% success in reducing the burden, um, but again, not very effective. So ablation therapy uh, in the present era, using all the tools that we talked about, certainly for us has been the go-to tool, and we use it as a primary management option uh, for treating these patients. So I think with that, uh, perhaps, uh, Nishan, we can uh, uh, revisit the questions one more time. Yeah, sure. And uh, maybe when we do that, I can ask you some of the questions that have come through on the chat function. Oh, or we can we can we can defer those questions because it's, uh... sure. So um, I guess you know you guys serve as a kind of a quaternary referral for ventricular arrhythmias. In your opinion, what is the most common reason for failure when you guys are getting a redo case? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, for us looking back at, you know, why we were not successful early on, even after we started using ICE, I think it has to do with just the recognition that, uh, you know, the source of the arrhythmia really has to be mapped very carefully. And in doing that, you have to truly define the anatomy of the pathogens as best as possible using Carter sound to create the structure and then kind of really convincing yourself that you truly map the different aspects of that structure before you come on power because you want to identify the early site. And then once you do that, recognizing that you know, depending on how good the contact is, if you are barely touching that structure and sometimes I've had to oblate literally resting my catheter on the body and the tip of and in that approach, if I start off with the traditional power settings of 15 to 20 watts and slowly increase the power, and the catheter is bound to get dislodged as the bubble starts coming out, that to me, I think is the most important thing is to really assess the source in terms of the earliest activation and then recognizing how your catheter is oriented relative to that source and then dialing up the power using those metrics. And then, you know, the, our comfort with power delivery, I think, has really also advanced uh, 
our success rates. Because once you recognize that your catheter is in you know, good contact, you can dial the power accordingly. If your catheter is not in great contact, you start off with high power, so you stay for a little bit longer. I think those, I feel, are the reasons why you can be successful or not. Okay. And actually, that leads into a bunch of people have asked, you know, what your normal power settings are. How aggressive will you be? We hear about 50 watts, half normal saline, never ending lesions. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. You know, how aggressive will you be if something's really deep? Right. Now, that's a great question. So, just for the record, we don't use half normal saline for our ablations. And actually, there's a paper from our group that's just come out in the most recent uh, Jack EP, uh, which talks to you know, what half normal saline, at least in the animal heart, does. Um, so I, I urge the audience to read that. It's just come out, provide you some perspective. So we don't use half normal saline for our purposes. In terms of power delivery, so like I said, if your catheter is in good contact, and I say good contact, 10 to 11 grams is plenty for these areas. If you're starting at 10 to 11 grams, you can start at about 20 watts with, a, with an irrigated catheter. And you're looking for about a 50 ohm drop. And if you can actually monitor the lesion with ice, that adds another dimension to your ability to tell when the lesion is you know, being created because you can really watch that area become echogenic. And sometimes that preempt, preempts the bubble formation. You start seeing a lot of bubbles, and that's the beginning of what could become like a steam pump if you're not attentive. So if your contact is about 10 grams plus, and your catheter is either tucked under the papillary muscle or resting between the heads of the papillary muscle or the contact position, a good vector on top of the papillary muscle, the catheter is pushing it down well. You can start at 20 watts, dial up every 10 or so seconds to get about a 15 minute drop. And typically, a lesion of 60 to 90 seconds should do the job. If you are buried inside the papillaries, I think 15 to 20 watts is a good place to start, and you will see that lesion form. And again, 10 to 15 ohm drops is plenty, 60 seconds. When your catheter is resting on the pan, and you really have very poor contact. You can literally see on ice your catheter bouncing back and forth. And if you have contact four cents, and if you get four to five grams, you're lucky. In that setting, where you're really not ablating into the muscle, but you're literally ablating on top of the muscle, we start at 40 to 50 watts. Because you are very close to the exit side. The exit side seems to be very superficial. All you need is maybe even 10 seconds of, you know, just like you abolish an atrial tachycardia, you, you don't need a lot. You just need that short duration of good energy. I think that's kind of how we decide where to set the power. And then do you have any recommendations for increased stability, either using, also considering transeptal or using a long sheath across the aortic valve? Yeah, so, you know, each of us has a preference, and I can tell you that 60% of our cases were done using the retrograde approach, 40% 40 40 were done using the transeptal approach, and about 20% of the times we used both. My sense is that, you know, whatever is your comfort level. So for us, retrograde access is the preferred approach, and that's what we go with, generally. Um, the transeptal approach can be helpful for the posterior medial Papillary muscle because coming through that valve and with the long sheet, a deflectible sheet, you can really get your catheter onto the fat. But if you do that, you have to be very, very careful because number one, if you're not watching the catheter tip on ice, the chances of the catheter slipping off the papillary muscle and getting into that inferior wall. So I've had one case of cardiac perforation with even just 20 watts of power for like 45 seconds just because the catheter was so, almost like a harpoon, it was like so deep in that muscle. And the muscle is healthy, you can really create a big lesion very quickly. So that's what you have to be careful with. But the posterior medial paps, the transeptal will be better. I have never had to use a long sheet retrograde to get across the aortic valve. Most of my partners have not had to do that either. The only time you may need to do that if somebody's got like a really big aortic root and 
you know, you're struggling with that. But I think it's mostly if you're ablating near the base of the uh, left ventricle near the valve, that that's helpful. For the papillary muscles, um, I don't think so. And then um, do you have any tricks uh, as sometimes it can be painful uh, and you try to avoid general anesthesia in these cases? Um, so any tricks to try and suppress the pain while you're ablating? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I got to tell you, I mean, these, you know, unlike your outflow tract ventricular arrhythmias, the papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias tend to be a lot more stubborn. So I have actually done some of these cases under general anesthesia. I mean, you can always do the trial early on. You know, we tend to put a Foley catheter in most of our patients just because, you know, these cases can, can, can be long. You know, they're not like the ventricular, you know, outflow tract tachycardias. These can be more challenging. So almost all our patients get done with Foley catheter. And when they're getting the Foley catheter, we try to put them you give them propofol and get them sedated. So that could be your test. If you're giving propofol and you're still having the PVCs, then you can keep this patient really deep. It's not going to impact you. Now, here's another interesting thing. I don't have data to necessarily um, prove what I'm going to say here, but it's just an observation. So one of the things that I do at the end of papillary muscle and in fact, all of them is we give isoproterenol for sure to kind of see the response. But it's not uncommon that sometimes these papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias will come back at the washout phase of isoprotrenal. So you get up to you know 20 mics of isoprotrenal and you don't see anything you feel great. And you're washing it off. And by that time, you say, okay, no papillary muscle ventricular arrhythmias catheters out. And as the isoprotrenal is getting washed off, I've had cases where they've come back and yet so go back. Sometimes the sheets were almost off. So that's the one thing I would, you know, caution people to do is go through that whole phase of isoprotermal challenge to be sure that you've got it. And you wait a, what, full 30 minutes? 30 minutes uh, or sometimes even an hour. Like what I'll tell them is, you know, so the fellows, if they start taking sheets out, so we just leave the stuff in the right groin till the patient is absolutely ready to get up the table. Okay. Uh, and then there are a couple questions here about um, mapping, I guess. So in a foci where pace map and activation are discordant, yes. uh, which one do you prefer? And if you're unsuccessful at your preferred one, do you empirically ablate at the other one? Well, so I guess the point I was trying to make in the approach is that activation mapping takes precedence over pace map. So that's what we are looking for. Whenever we are sampling the papillary muscle to identify the site of based on activation mapping, the only time we use face mapping is when there's a paucity of the tachycardia. So then you have only one PVC or two PVCs as it, uh, that you've been able to save on your review screen. So you face map to perfection. But if the PVCs are happening enough that you can do activation mapping, and that's what we use. And if the activation mapping shows us the earliest point and the base map there is not good, that would still be our set. Yeah. Um, and then if there are, there's divergence between the base map and the activation map, um, we continue to sample, but not, again, I, to be honest with you, I can't tell you if I've ever done or found a case where the base map was great at a location which was very far from where the activation map was. I don't see why that should happen unless you specifically capture just the fiber and the 3.5 millimeter tip catheter to capture just the fiber and get a great base map remote from the site of the activation, earliest activation. It just seems like it shouldn't happen. And then a tough scenario, um, PVC triggered VF cases where you don't have PVCs. What do you guys do in that situation? Great question, great question. So there we kind of do a little bit of everything, which is we, uh, you know, obviously try to put our catheter at the PVC uh, site that we think it's coming from, and then try to, you know, base from there to see if that triggers something. Sometimes we do program stimulation from 
Sometimes we'll get low energy from our catheter in that spot to see if RF energy can trigger PVC. What I got to tell you, I mean, our, our success rates for PVC mediated VF and polymorphic VT, where we don't have objective evidence of that actually happening during the procedure, our uh, outcomes are not that good. Yeah. And do you guys consider autonomic modulation in those cases? Uh, not, uh, not as the first, second, or third option. Maybe after we've sort of failed many, many times, might we do that? But, uh, but no, not not as as the next option after the first failed radiation. 